this is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright, and you're listening to Krypton Report. Up in the sky, look! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's the Krypton Report! host Tyler and welcome to Krypton Report, a podcast dedicated to all things Superman, Supergirl. We're going to look at the Supergirl TV series as well as the Krypton TV series, anything that has to do with the characters in their world. Comics, movies, TV shows, we will talk about everything and anything. We are part of the Southgate Media Group Podcasting Network. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Krypton Report. You can also email us at kryptonreportpod at gmail.com. If you get a chance to go over to iTunes, Apple Podcast, please leave us a review to help us get better. You can find me personal at JTY Patrick on Twitter and everything else. You can buy a Krypton Report t shirt at tpublic.com. Check it out. They have all sizes, colors, styles of shirts. Just go to tpublic.com and search Krypton Report and you'll see our logo. And every time you buy a shirt, it helps support other podcasts from southgatemedia.com. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Krypton Report. This is a very special Krypton Report because in this episode, we're actually going to talk about the season one finale of Krypton. One of the shows that this podcast was named after because when we came up with this podcast... We were supposed to get Supergirl and Krypton about the same time. And here we are, three years into Supergirl and one season into Krypton while Supergirl still goes on. So times table is a little shaky, but that's okay because we're excited. And when I say we, I mean me and James. That's right. You know why? If Solomon was awake, he would be here with us. Because he loved the ending of this episode. Spoilers coming. But James's text sums up his emotional feelings in a couple of words that we cannot say on this show. So let's get into Krypton and welcome Mr. James Cole. Hey, Tyler. How's it going? Good, man. Let's... This... All right. First of all, this episode was awesome. Um, And my mind hurts from thinking time travel. Like, yeah, I mean, it's the the time travel aspect of it. I'm I'm really um, excited that, that they don't have to with the time travel aspect. They can they can go back and correct it. So they have the freedom to be able to open it up and tell a very, very interesting story, which seems seems like season two is going to be like majorly interesting. Um, we're we're going to get to. Uh... We're going to get to season two uh, predictions when we at the end of this episode. Because right, already, already to go into the episode, we haven't talked news yet. <laughs> yeah, seriously, um, news. We're we're going to try to make this brief, but we got some news, people. Um, first of all, news wise, we'll, we'll we'll brush over some of the quick speculation. Speculation. No big deal. Um, ben Affleck wants to stay as Batman. When it happens, it happens. I'm not holding my breath. Um, I'd like it to happen. So would I. Stephen Amell wants Superman to appear on Arrow. We'll see if that happens. Um, hey, I want Ty- Tyler Hecklin back. He's, yeah. he's done a good job. Um, let's see. Tom Cruise has been mentioned about being maybe Hal Jordan in the DC cinematic films. Uh, my thoughts on that is don't really want him to, um, because I feel like he's an attention hog and that was part of what killed the mummy. Um, and if they're going to pick an older Hal Jordan, you know, do the, the brown hair with like the white sides. Just go ahead and do Nathan Fillion. The guy's still in great shape. Still do the role. Um, everybody loves him. Just go ahead and do an older Hal Jordan with Nathan Fillion. Oh, yeah. He's he's perfect. I wanted him as Nathan Fillion back back before Ryan Reynolds. and um, You know, he's the voice of him in, in so many animated versions. Um, exactly. He's, so, he's, got the, he's got the Hal Jordan swagger that 
even though I, I like Green Lantern for what it is, you know, it's, uh, Ryan Reynolds does, he has that sarcastic, um, swagger, a little, little less than the confident swagger that, um, Nathan Fillion has. Exactly. And that's what, like, I just watched the trailer. Nathan Fillion has a new show coming out called The Rookie. I am going to watch that for sure. Yeah. I'm going to watch the show and it looks like a great, like he looks great in it. So like, that's why I'm saying he could just go ahead and still be Hal Jordan. Uh, and speaking of Ryan Reynolds, I guess there was a tweet thing that was sent out by Warner Brothers that they said they want their Green Lantern ring back from Ryan Reynolds from all the hate that he puts on it. So just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, let's see here. I think that's just, I think that's just them being salty. Yeah. He, I, he knows that there's, uh, he know, you know, I think Ryan Reynolds just knows that, you know, the movie wasn't what it should have been. You know, he, he could knock on it like everybody else. I mean, heck, he was the star of it. It's not like he's really saying, like, I wish I never did Green Lantern. He just makes a lot of jokes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I agree. Uh, we got, trying to keep this a little bit more concise here so my notes were all over the place. Um, season seven of Arrow, supposedly Oliver's going to be getting the classic mustache and goatee. That'll be interesting to see on Stephen Amell. It'll be nice to see as Green Arrow becomes more and more Green Arrow. Um, let's see. Krypton officially is getting a season two. I thought that was already con- confirmed, but I guess not. Yeah, I thought, I thought the same thing, that it was confirmed, but it's um, been breaking this week. So, And then Supergirl's going to move to Sunday nights in the fall. That's going to be weird, but... I think it could work. Um, like you and I were talking about, if they do that and they don't do this broken schedule, like I, I mentioned to you how if somebody was, you know, has Netflix and they're watching all the shows, if they get to the crossover episode, they're going to miss the first episode because it was on Supergirl because Supergirl's not on Netflix yet because it hasn't finished its season. So if they can organize these shows to where they're right behind each other, so they're a little bit more concise, and we don't have a break where one show takes over for a month or two. It'll be nice. Yeah, yeah, it'll be nice for for the, the postseason media, you know, streaming to be able to binge it and stuff like that. Um, I'm I do like the the new slate. I mean, sure it's Sunday, but honestly, what are people doing on Sunday? Majority of people are at home getting ready for work. So yeah, they're interested. Plus they've got Supergirl leading into charm. So they may have that fan base who's actually going to pick up watching their new reboot. Anyways, this isn't about that, but no, um, that's, I mean, that's actually, I mean, for the longest time, you know, Smallville and Supernatural were paired up because they had a very similar fan base and that gave them, you know, strengths on that night. Naturals. Yeah, Supernatural's going into 14th season next year. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and then there's one one more piece of news for the, wait, two more pieces. One more for Supergirl for the TV series. Um, rumor has it that Manchester Black is coming to Supergirl. And you know what that means for me and you, James? It's like our dream come true. Because the first time James and I talked, we talked about Superman versus the Elite. And one of the things I said was Manchester Black would be a great villain to have on Supergirl. Yeah, um, I'm excited about that. Um, you know, it really, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find something really fast. Oh, no, you're okay. fine. Uh, there it is. Uh, yeah, uh, for Supergirl, Manchester Black coming in, you know. Um, I, I think that's a really good, uh, I hope it's a really good change for season four. I mean, kind of like season three or, um, like the flash, the flash had speedsters season one, two, and three mm-hmm. and to change it. Well, season, uh, with Supergirl now, all three seasons have, um, the, the overarching story of the season has been, uh, extraterrestrial threats. Mm-hmm. Um, which makes sense. I mean, she's an alien, so, you know, that makes sense. But, um, you know, I think the fourth season will be nice when she's more challenged, uh, 
more challenged on earth, you know, um, from, from earth, uh, her being challenged, her, her views and, uh, her actions of her heroism, you know, that being challenged by like Manchester black and, and the elite, you know, quote unquote, um, it, their powers, they're so powerful, you know, same thing with Superman that they'd be, they'd easily be able to keep her at bay and, and escape and do what they want to do. Um, you know, and they would do a similar thing, you know, um, uh, they would, you know, leave her feeling helpless while they're, they're killing and stopping criminals. And, you know, the public would be behind that because they're not under threat because these, um, these criminals are, are not going to be around anymore. They can't break out. They, you know, they, this lot less threats. So, you know, the public wouldn't be behind her as well, you know, so that would be an interesting change for season four, her public, uh, appearance, um, her public views being negative towards her because people are, are kind of going the, are, are supporting the elite and Manchester black and what they're in, in their ways. Exactly. I mean, you, you pretty much hit it right there on the head. Um, so I, I definitely, I liked what you said about there needs to be a change with the season. You know, I had with the flash, like I liked Savitar f- at first when it was more Dr. Alchemy. And I wish that maybe they had done the Savitar storyline or whatever in season four and, cause we needed a break from an evil speedster. Um, but I think the thinker was a great, way of um, just reviving that entire uh, series. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, there were some moments in this season that it kind of, it kind of got repetitive, but it really did change the tone of the season. Um, you know, for just, just being the same thing over and over again, speedster, speedster, speedster. That'll be that'll be good for Supergirl, you know. It's not always about this big alien extraterrestrial threat, you know. Mm-hmm. They're the, the the you know Superman and Supergirl, you know. They stand a lot for the same thing, and there are plenty of people on Earth who already don't like the idea of aliens on Earth and things like that. So they've touched on that here and there um, throughout the three seasons. You know, um, but it kind of would be a big thing, uh, for that to be a major part of season four because it would cause her to, um, to, to grow in a different way than what they've actually just only touched upon here and there. All right. Now, the last thing we have for the TV verse, and this is pretty big, is Batwoman is coming to Arrowverse. That's the crossover, is Batwoman. And okay, that woman in Gotham City. You know they they've hinted at the existence of Batman, and I think with all the tie ups and hang ups that you could get, I think Batwoman's the right play for TV because we're never going to see like a Batwoman in a movie. Um, you know we we're supposed to get a Batgirl movie and Nightwing and Batman and all that. But to bring in someone from the Bat family on the television, um, I think Batwoman's the right play. It's exciting. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they haven't specified if they're going to do it on um, Earth-1 or if they're going to do it on Earth-38. You know, some people like to see it on Earth-38 where, you know, not everything always happens on Earth-1. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, and even if Black Lightning is going to be involved this year, because we still don't even know what Earth Black Lightning is on, if he's with, if he's on the Earth with Supergirl, which they brought it up, they've mentioned her by name, but that's it. And so that's exciting. I mean, that's just, you know, another, and it's another female hero. So I say bring it on, Batwoman. Uh, let's see here. Now, 
Other news, quickly. Uh, Wonder Woman's going to get a new costume in Wonder Woman 2. No big surprise there. It's all just good marketing. Um, the actress that played the Flash, his girlfriend, Iris, in Justice League, um, that was cut from Justice League, is said she's still supposed to be Iris West in the Flash solo film. So that's good news, I guess. I mean, that's just news. We got our first good look at Shazam in a poster where it's Shazam drinking a cola, it looks like. I'm pretty sure that's that's similar to an image from the comics where where he's walking with Freddy drinking a big old a big gulp or something. <laughs> yep. Oh, it is. It's great because I mean it just it has that like I'm an adult, but I'm a kid look to it. It, it seriously looks like a 12 year old in a, in a superhero's body. <laughs> and with that was also the first look at Jason Momoa's Aquaman and his new, more Atlantean armor, which looks pretty cool. I'm not a hundred percent sold on it. I yeah. actually I like his Justice League look better, but. Um, it, it looks more like armor, you know, like a, a standard breastplate, like belt, like warrior armor. I, I like the Justice League look. It looks more like a a suit. Yeah. Um, well, even in Justice League, we don't even know what the specific, you know, what he wanted from her was because, you know, I mean, if things are to be BBS, you know, he had the the Quindent before. So if there wasn't that, we didn't get that from her. Exactly. And that's a whole nother discussion that <laughs> we're going to do when we do our justice league commentary, because that's something I said after I saw, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. And then last little thing I got here is they released the first image of, uh, the redesign of this DC superhero girls that are going to get their, I guess an official cartoon series and not just the, the tiny animated shorts that they have online. And it just, it looks okay. It just looks like the same basic, really low budget animation. That's, that's uh cartoon network's bread and butter these days. You know, it's, it's, it's cheap, uh, easy to draw form. digitally. Yeah. It's, it's the short form media, 10 to 12 minutes long. It's the same cheap, quick animation that all of their other shows are these days. Uh, I mean, cheap, quick, put it out there, sell some toys. And I mean, that's like all it is for cartoon Network these days, sadly. And I don't even want to, I don't like, I don't want to buy the toys because they look like junk, you know, like, first of all. Oh yeah. I've, I've got my daughter, uh, some of the super, uh, the DC superhero girl dolls. And I'm going to have to snatch up the rest of them before these other toys start coming out because they look like crap. If they have yeah. animation style, they just look like crap. I got Sayla the large, like, 12, 13-inch figures of uh, Wonder Woman, Batgirl, and Supergirl. And I wanted to get... got uh, Supergirl, Wonder Woman, and Harley Quinn right now, I believe. And... I was thinking like, okay, Young Justice, everyone said they didn't sell toys for, and that was part of what hurt it. Do you remember what the Young Justice toys looked like? They were garbage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they weren't like, they weren't even toys that I would want. I mean, if you just Google like Young Justice toys, you'll, you'll be disappointed. Excuse me. Ooh, man. Kids, keep me up. Like, <laughs> They just weren't that great looking. They were small and very, very, very simplistic. Uh, If they had, I don't know, if they were just a little bit more interesting. Like, I'll tell you what toys I really like. I really like the six inch toys they've put out for um, Justice League and BVS. I feel like they were very well done where they were articulate and detailed enough 
to be enjoyable, but they were simple enough to enjoy playing with. Oh, right, like the, the cheaper line of toys, not like the uh, multiverse or the icons or anything? Exactly. You know, like the, there are six inch, Solomon's got Batman, which Superman and Wonder Woman. And then I think we bought Flash from Justice League. And that, we we're trying to find the cyborg that's not completely like robot looking. And oh my great. God, those are terrible. Yeah. I just got the pictures you sent me. Yeah. yeah. Those, those are terrible. That does not even look like Aqualad. Like that is awful. So, I mean, they, they weren't the, the greatest of toys. They're, you know, um, very simplistic. And, you know, if you don't have good toys that kids want, but also adults want to buy and add to their collection, then it's going to have problems. Uh, you know, um, I mean, thank God Young Justice has such a fan base, such a loyal fan base. And thank God Young Justice is such a well uh, thought out and well produced show that it's coming back on the streaming service and I'm still just static and can't wait for it to come out. Maybe if it keeps going, they'll have a uh, Young Justice line with uh, the multiverse toys because they've got toys that look like the actors in live action. They've got toys that look like the animation, like uh, for the Dark Knight Returns, um, with Superman and Terry Kelly and the armor, the Batman. So, you know, they've got an extremely good line going there. That'd be a perfect line to put out some really good Young Justice toys. And I agree completely. Um, you know, one thing is we were talking about, um, what do you call it? The, the, the toys, the, I can't even talk now. Um, but with the detailed toys, like I'm still waiting for my Tyler Hecklin Superman figure to come out. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have the multiverse figure of Supergirl. I don't think we have a multiverse figure of Martian Manhunter, but we have the DC icon, uh, higher end one. I really need my Tyler Hecklin Superman figure to drop because that's one I want to add to my collection of Superman. Yeah, but, they, they have the Flash. They have uh, they have Supergirl. They have some of the television characters in the multiverse. So, yeah, that'd be nice when they come out with Tyler Hecklin. So now we're going to talk about the season finale of Krypton. And I'm going to let James take the lead on this one. Oh, all right. Well, I just finished it. We pick up right, uh, we pick up right at the end of the last episode where, um, Brainiac has, uh, come to Kandor, um, uh, via his sentry. Apparently he can, um, I think, I think his consciousness kind of like it doesn't have a central body. I think it kind of goes from, Body to body. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, too. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it seemed. So that way, when he, his consciousness, his, the, the voice got blown up, and when it came back together, it was Brainiac. I think he, I think he was close enough to the planet, and that he just, you know, reformed himself. His consciousness was then in that body on, on the planet of Krypton. But he dropped the shield, and, the the weather started to come into the city, and uh, I mean it was really interesting. The ship finally came in. The idea that the Krypton is environment is like the harsh, you know, for lack of a better term, Donner s Krypton, and because of that shield is how we got more of the Snyder s Krypton. Yeah. I, I that was a good amalgamation that I made. They they knew what they knew what they were doing. They knew how to take care of it. Yeah, we, and it was actually really cool the way Candor City kind of sits both in the Outlands and and on the other side. So like, there's a lot of sunlight on part of it, but then on the other part, it's it's, it's a little in the dark. There's all the snow and everything, which is 
guarded when the shield is up, but it was snowing in the city when after the shield had come down. Um, but we get Brainiac's ship finally coming in over over Candor. Um, Brainiac is is here. He's, he's ready to bottle up Candor. We see it like inject its tentacle looking things out and start to cover Candor. Candor. <laughs> yeah, it starts to cover Candor kind of like and you can see it with all the little cities that they showed on the ship before that like all of the bottles aren't quite like just what what you've seen in previous comics things like that just just a a, a bottle literally <laughs> um they're actually covered in a force field they're wrapped with like the same tentacle type stuff you know but they are shrunken still but we actually get to see in this um episode that when that uh Val is explaining what Brainiac does with these cities that that they that he takes and that people inside are alive and, um, and preserved but they're all frozen in time yes and that explains that Adam Strange is in a city on Brainiac's ship that looks like Earth? That's what I said. It looks just like Earth. People are on cell phones. There's buildings. It certainly doesn't look like an alien. Now, you we'll said... To that. <laughs> you said Val. Let's talk about real quick that when Val L. fell, when he was supposedly killed... He actually teleported himself to the Phantom Zone and has been in the Phantom Zone since then. And through Zod and Seg, they're able to bring Val out of the Phantom Zone and into present day Krypton. Yes, Val is alive. Which is awesome. And I love his cape. So Zod um, decides that. The only way, Brainiac is here, and the only way, without Doomsday, he believes, to challenge Brainiac is with the knowledge that Valel possesses. Because he knows that Valel is alive. He found, he spent time with him in the Phantom Zone. Come to find out, he lied and cheated and stole Val's device and escaped the Phantom Zone trade and left Val in there. Um, Zod is certainly showing his colors in this episode. Yes. It's very manipulative. Yes, he is. Um, so he goes in, which I thought was really nice, the way he talks about um, time and space being non-existent in the Phantom Zone. That for him to go in and locate Val, it could be days or weeks, but for them, it would be almost instantaneous. So he goes in and almost instantly, both of them come back out, which didn't he just, I, I got a little confused with that. Didn't he say only one person could use it at a time or something? I think so. <laughs> cause, cause I was in there. Um, cause I was, a little confused at the first moment, uh, the way he said it, and then I, and then it kind of dawned on me what he meant when he was like, you know, like what you just said about for me it could be days, weeks, whatever, but for you it'll be instantaneously. I I I thought he meant it more like I need to be the one that, to go because I could find him faster. Um, but yeah, it kind of I was like, oh, that's what he meant. <laughs> Right. Um, but yeah, Val L is alive. He's been alive for the last 14 cycles in, in the, uh, uh, in the Phantom Zone, which is very interesting. So it's nice we actually get Val back. And, uh, you know, even moving forward, it looks like he's going to be busy in, in the future come season two. 
Yep, hold that thought because. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna get back. <laughs> we're gonna get back around to that um, because. Where is it? Hold on. So we get to, we get to see Dev M now has a bionic arm, and all I could think was he's now the Winter Soldier. <laughs> With your Winter Soldier arm. <laughs> and okay, so they have the knowledge about Krypton's destruction. If Brainiac, you know, even succeeds in taking Candor, could they do something to? prepare the whole planet to, to, to fly off, you know, and colonize a new planet and make Krypton, new Krypton or something. Right. Right. Um, Mm. yeah, with that, with that knowledge of the future, I mean, sure. It's going to be hard to get people to, especially the way they discuss about the um, same, same corrupt government is what allowed the planet at the planet and everybody uh, on it to be destroyed. Um, now here, here's ready. Have you ever seen the movie Looper? Yes, I have. <laughs> awesome. I love it. I love okay. it. <laughs> now, the one thing about Looper, real quick, side tangent, is at the end. Spoilers, people. Okay, spoilers right now. If you haven't seen Looper, stop this. Go see it or skip ahead. Um, I'll try to figure out how long I'm ahead, but. At the end, when Joseph Gordon-Levitt shoots himself, okay, it stops Bruce Willis. But technically, it should have rewound the entire movie because nothing in that movie would have happened because a younger version never grew up to be the older version to go back in time to fight the younger version, okay? Now, think about that and think about how Eddie destroyed... uh, Thawne in the first season of Flash. Okay. Mm-hmm. Could Seg kill himself or do something and having Zod not not being born? And then Zod that would is, be there? That is quite a possibility, honestly. Um, the only thing that I kind of think is that she is now pregnant with See, baby Zod from the last time. And that's, okay, that goes back to what if she's naturally pregnant because they have not told us why they cannot reproduce naturally, okay? Mm-hmm. Lyda is naturally pregnant with baby Zod and Corvex is going to become jor because he was named Corvex because Seg was going to be a Vex. But now that he's been regilded or whatever as an L, mm-hmm. name would change. Or they're having Corvex and she's pregnant or something. Maybe there's a third brother. I don't know. All I know is it's getting trippy with some yeah. time travel and some, you know, does Zod have to, you know, take care of Seg to make sure that he is created? Right. Um, well, we did see, oh, no, that's, that's a little bit farther ahead. I was going to say this though. Like, do you feel like light is slight becoming more evil in this episode? Like, we don't get Jaina in this episode at all. No, no. We, uh, we, we do they, see that they bring, Superman's it up. They bring her up. But. We do see that Superman's cape's almost completely gone, but we don't get Jaina at all. And uh, Well, certainly with the turn of events, I mean, in the moving forward in the future, uh, we certainly could be could be heading that route. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So we get Val. We've got uh, Brainiac. We um, see that the um, General Zod tries to make a plan idea about giving Val to Brainiac to spare Krypton. Yeah, because Val has, uh, I'm guessing through the Phantom Zone, has figured a way to see the future, glimpse the future. So I think, you know, he's trying to give Brainiac that new knowledge, knowledge he wouldn't have because Val's not in Candor. Trying to give him that knowledge to be able to glimpse the future 
um, and to spare the city of Candor. And Seg's like, no. And they like they have a skirmish. Um, there's got to be another way. So, you know, that's like you're saying, Zod showing his colors. And I'll tell you right now, this is my favorite Zod, hands down. Oh, yeah, by the end, I was like, wow, that is, that is powerful. Because um, I was watching it with Jania, and she hasn't watched the whole series with me. She's, like, been in and out. And I'm like, he's got okay. the perfect regal aristocraticness that Terrence Stamp had, but the, the might and intensity that Michael Shannon had. Yeah, yeah. Like he's, he is the perfect blend of the two. And I'm like, this, this is my favorite General Zod. Uh, yeah, um, big time. Um, <clears throat> you know, they, I mean, in Smallville, they tried to make Callum Blue like, a young version of Terrence Stamp. And I mean, you know, he did a good job. Honestly, I think he stepped up his acting game in the one episode he was in in the 10th season. Yes. In the ninth season, he seemed very, uh, pretty over the top trying to pull it off. You one know, original. But, yeah. But in the 10th season and he was only in it for an episode, he really stepped his game up and, and he felt more comfortable or he looked more comfortable. But, um, uh, so yeah, they, they, Zod comes up with that plan to do that for Brainiac. And, um, Lyda at this point is, is, uh, ordering the Sagittari there. She won't allow them to, um, to be fearful and, and run from Brainiac. She's, she's determined to fight. And she, uh, orders a bunch of Sagittari out bunch of skimmers and they're going out to fight Brainiac and with a wave of his hand well first all the skimmers are flying in and you see all the people of Kandor they start to see you know they see their warriors their their army moving in and they're cheering they see it they're cheering they're happy and with a wave of his hand Brainiac just blows up all the skimmers in midair, they all go crashing to the, uh, crashing to the planet. I know the whole tele, uh, telekinetic telepathic brainiac is intense. Yeah. He, he's powerful in this, which honestly, I mean, he should be, you know, there should not be a way that the people on Krypton without any superpowers, they shouldn't stand a chance. That's, that's, the, that's the way it is. That's the story. You know, it's, He's got generations and planets worth of power and technology. So <clears throat> we're going to pause on Brainiac for a second. We're going to jump back to a character we haven't really touched on. We're going to talk about her story with Nyssa. Now, Nyssa has snuck in to Kandar. She goes to with jo- Jack's or to the to, where they have the Codex. And I'll just say right now, the Codex in this looks much better than the weird skull Codex thing in Man of Steel. Well, the one thing she did, she came in and I think she ran into Jaxor because she was there to yes. take her child. She demanded the Genesis chamber prep her child Corvex for, um, for transport to move out of Canada. Which is interesting because they hadn't even been bonded yet together, but they'd already submitted their DNA to create Corvex. Mm-hmm. And Jaxer and Nissa begin a, 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 a communication and she asks her about, you know, how her mother died and all this. And I'm thinking, okay, they're going to say that Jaxer is Nissa's mom. That was my first thought because they already set up that she used to have a different name mm. and it's not anymore. Yeah, uh-huh. that's an interesting thought. I did, that one didn't occur to me. And then what we find out is that Nyssa, as we know her, is actually one of the Vera Protocol clones. That she actually died in the in the accident with her mother. And that they used, you know, they were able to, pro- there was enough life or whatever in her body to program her clone with the mental uh, memories and brain patterns of her original self. And... She's, you know, she begins freaking out saying, 
that, you know, her whole life is a lie and all this. And I'm kind of thinking, is it a lie? I mean, it's just like the same mind, new body, same person. Yeah. I mean, but you know, you just like Jack Stewart talks about, I mean, the greed of the, of the elite houses, you know, mm -hmm. live, trying to live, uh, their consciousness, um, immortally you know transferring it from just empty shell to empty shell just their consciousness living on and i'm i'm like that's a big deal like we don't know how young or old nissa supposedly was and how the we we see some of the bodies in the um bear protocol they all look more like they're in adulthood Right. See, I'm still, I'm still wondering about the, um, if Zod is a natural birth in this version or if he still comes from the Kodak or if he still comes from the Genesis chamber. Um, cause I mean, if he was pregnant, if she was already pregnant, he would exist. He wouldn't disappear. But if, if, uh, um, what happens to say, you know, was permanent, like at this, or, you know, at least partially permanent, like what, would he have been, would they go to the chamber and, and pair their DNA to, to create him from the chamber as he, as he had been in, you know, born from the chamber before. Right. That's why you the know? way that they talk about his birth and his, you know, everything, I feel like it was hidden. And that's why, um, and I want to know, like, could light to go to the Genesis chamber insert her DNA and then pull up like segs like mm. how does it work like it's on file or whatever you know where him and Nissa inserted theirs does seg have to produce another sample right, um, right or could she just go and do it so let's jump ahead a little bit to Nissa and Jax are meet up with everybody a little bit later I'm wait hold on I'm trying to remember something. I'm trying to remember. Jack Sir eventually sees Val and he's alive and she's excited and shocked at the same time. Not a big spoiler. I can't remember where that falls in. It's not in my notes here. But yeah, that's actually pretty much towards the end, kind of after everything else has happened. Okay. So we get um basically Brainiac shows up in the fortress. Yep, Zod leads Brainiac to the fortress to to get Val. And the, he meant he le, he mentions Brainiac as a twelfth level intellect. Um, mm -hmm. He shows up. Let's see. And I I also had here in my notes about uh, if Light is in Kandar when it's taken, you know, how does that affect the birth creation of General Zod? Like, cause, yeah, because. Yeah, because he pretty much had Candor uh, at that time. Because um, we saw everybody starting to slow down. Yep, everybody started to freeze. Uh, you know, Seg earlier on, he, he talked with Lyda and you know, said, good job for, you know, uh, distracting Brainiac. A lot of people escaped Candor. And uh, so that was pretty, you know, that was pretty cool. They They were all working together, doing something. Um, but yeah, they were, they were at the point there when Candor was about to be taken. People were frozen and the city was, was becoming grounded in that force field. And so because of that, we have Brainiac in the fortress. Um, and he's talking to Val and he comes up to attack Val, find out it's just the hologram of Val. And basically they suck Brainiac into the phantom zone. Yeah, it was a nice little, uh, nice little, uh, uh, trick on, um, uh, on Sagan Val's part there, using the hologram to kind of distract Brainiac and bring him up onto the, the, the platform. So Sag could activate the Phantom Zone projector. And we see while that's happening, Superman's cape is being rebuilt and repaired. Which was actually really cool. They, they did a really close, CGI look of uh, the fibers coming back together and regrowing 
that was that was actually pretty cool. And I kind of wish, like, as I thought about it more and more, I wish that like Val's cape was like a family heirloom that he passes to Seg, Seg passes to Jarrell, then Jarrell gave it to Cal, and that's actually Cal's cape. Mm-hmm. Just that's something I like they did in some comics and stuff. So, um, so that's happening, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, okay, that's weird because he didn't take Kandar yet. So how is that possible? Um, did he just like just what he did the little bit he did, you know, screw up the planet's core? And then as Brainiac's getting sucked into the Phantom Zone, who else gets sucked into the Phantom Zone? Sig. Brainiac uses his tentacle like uh things to reach out and grab Sag and get pulled into the Phantom Zone. Val reaches up and grabs his hands, trying to hold him, trying to help pull him back. And Seg gives him a nice uh, a nice callback to the first episode when Val tells him to um, keep believing in a better tomorrow. And he tells his, his grandfather to once again start believing in a better tomorrow. And part of me just wanted to like insert as that was happening. Seg just looks at him and says, always hold on to Smallville. <laughs> um, and you know I'm sitting there thinking like okay how okay and that's where it comes back around like we talked about well if Seg's in the Phantom Zone is it up to Val to carry on the family lineage or is Lyta and already pregnant um because we have to ensure General Zod's creation or like, is it going to be like a paradox thing, like a thon or something? Right. Yeah, because like, if he got sucked into the Phantom Zone at this point, I mean, it, I, the only way if she's not pregnant is for him to get out and then still have to to bond their DNA to make Zod if if she isn't pregnant. So that's kind of a convoluted story there i mean it'd be easier for her to be pregnant at this point yep let's not try to be james cameron here and make one of the <laughs> biggest paradoxes of time travel that's annoying <laughs> so we see Sorry. general good old general zod destroys um the phantom zone console so they can't retrieve seg brainiac's gone which yes, Brainiac gets sucked into the into the Phantom Zone, and his ship it actually releases the city, and his ship crashes on the outskirts of Kandor City. And as uh, General Zod blows up the the um, fortress panel, the, the fortress computer, um, which interestingly enough, I mean. I didn't know everything. All of his information was stored in that one location because he seems like all is lost after he blew that up. Yes. <laughs> but um, he blows it up and the cape starts to change. The, the house, the yellow Superman symbol, the yellow house of L S on the cape starts to change to black and red and changes to a Zod symbol. And, Zod. and then I got, and I was like, okay. And this goes back to my somehow, is this going to be like a story of Val, Val Zod, you know, um, the Superman of Earth 2 later on in the comics. Um, you know, and we see Val later. I'm sure the element. Yeah. As the, as the closing credits are going, like Val's trying to rebuild the Phantom Zone, we see Zod giving a speech, rallying Krypton together. He's now assuming command as their leader. Um, yeah, goes, building up the military. Um, and this is actually the part that got me like, when I, when I texted you my, my summary of it real quick there with a couple of words I can't say, just holy, you know, because that, part when he had all of the other leaders of the other city states in front of him and he just he was up there and he demanded kneel before Zod and that was powerful like 
Like, like nobody's ever done it like Terrence Stamp. And that was powerful. <laughs> that made me like, wow. And like, he is, like, we see wherever Adam Strange is, like, there's a Zod statue all of a sudden. Um, mm-hmm. We see Kim signing up for the military. Like, really quick. Like, I've been looking for him the whole episode. We see him in line getting, like, his military issue uh, clothes. And it seems like he's being forced into the military. Yes. Too happy, although he's not happy at this point since, you know, Ona got blown up and everything. And the very end of the episode is what kind of made me happy and sad because Solomon was watching with me the whole time for this. Hoping for the... We hear a thud. Thud. Glass break scream and we see doomsday punch out and that's the closing shot of season one and that was my other that was my other thing for the uh for my my review i texted to you zod was the holy moment and uh this moment here at the end doomsday looks awesome you know just yes a little yes. Bit sweet inside what we've seen before but we actually saw it like in motion and the arm punch out and you saw all those spines and stuff, the bones and the arm and everything. Like so much truer than anything done before and you know, looks better just because it's, you know, CGI and it's not like a bodysuit like Smallville. Smallville had a bodysuit and honestly and given Smallville's bo- given Smallville's bodysuit, but the, the lighting and the camera angles they use for the majority of Doomsday, he looked like Doomsday. Yes. Even with it being a prosthetic body suit, they did a really good job of lighting him right. Of CGI I think it looked right. You know, and the BVS, I think Doomsday was too big. It looked more like that's how Dark Side should be. He was too big. He never got enough bones grown on him. And uh, I hate it when he became like electric doomsday. Like that, that to me just really angered me right there. Um, but yeah, being too big was one thing. Like he's supposed to be bigger than Superman, but not like seven times the size of Superman. Yeah. I mean, his, I, I think, what did they describe his mass as before? Like, like, I don't know, somewhere between 800, 900 to like 1200 pounds or something. I mean, that's only like, you know, with with the mass of the character, I mean, that's only like three times the size, four times the size of Superman. That's full mass. That's not like, you know, yeah. three times the height than, you know, three times everything else. I'm talking about like as a whole mass, you know what I mean? So that would only make him like nine feet tall, not like 14 feet tall and like 12 feet wide. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, but that's, we can digress on that later, but. Yeah. What do you give this episode rating wise? Uh, 9.5. 9.5. I was at the end, like I said, I don't even know if I finished what I was saying, but I, at the very end, I was like, oh my God. Like, that was a great lead in and a good ending to the Brainiac story that they, that they started this season with. And they set it up. I mean, they can still have Brainiac return. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he can come back and there can still be some uh, play with Brainiac in the future. And of course the, what happened at the end that just opens up the time travel that if they had ended Krypton like this, of them very like I would have needed like like a two hour film or something kind of like how they did the Battlestar Galactica films mm. like they would have a season then every now they'd have like a Battlestar Galactica movie because you couldn't end the series on this note right it's like Firefly one season and, and then you had to have a movie to kind of help wrap it up like yeah exactly so I'm glad they're having a second season. What's going to be very interesting is Doomsday. Um, 
we know that it is a force of destruction unlike any other um, on a planet without anybody with superpowers. I mean, it's... <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say because, honestly, that would be just... His name says it all. That's just the next You can find us on Instagram, Twitter... Facebook at Krypton Report. You can also email us at kryptonreportpod at gmail.com. If you get a chance to go over to iTunes, please leave us a review to help us get better. If you're an Amazon shopper, just remember you can go to southgatemediagroup.com. There's a portal log into Amazon, and you shop into your account just regular, but it also helps keep all the podcasts on and helps keep Southgate running. Remember, look up in the sky.